So if you'd like to take your seats, please, and welcome to everybody that's joining us online. The next session should last no more than one hour. Well, welcome everybody to uh, this session. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit before we go into our first presentation. Um, when we were, as a steering group, planning this event, uh, we talked about the elements uh, that support families living with dementia with living bodies. And we kind of came up with the idea that there were <coughs> three sides to a triangle, which is where we came up with the, the three strands for our uh, Living with Living programme, which was um, hope through research, empowerment through information, and connection through community. Now, over the last day and a half, we've heard um, about research, which was fantastic this morning, and so positive, I'm actually delighted to hear that. And yesterday we, we heard a bit more about um, information and how important that is, that we have the right information at the right time. So this session really is to focus on um, community and what that brings to people and the importance of um, sharing experiences and getting tips and ideas. Um, so that is the, th the third side of the triangle. So I'm, I'm delighted to be hosting this session. My name is Catherine Butcher uh, and I work at the National Innovation Centre for Aging. My co host today is Janice. Thank you. Janice Kasper, who's an Alan Craig Clark. Thank you very much. Um, so, shall we we'll go straight into the first presentation, which is uh, Karen Meenan? Um, hello, everybody. I'm Karen Meenan um, from Dublin, uh, Lily Buddy Ireland. So, the first thing we're going to share now is a short video, and this video is the Forget Me Nots Choir. So, the Forget Me Nots Choir is a dementia inclusive choir. It's made up of, there are 130 members, believe it or not. Uh, about a third are people who have dementia, and about a third are caregivers, and about a third are just people from the community who like to sing. Some sing in harmony, some are come from local choirs who support harmonies to make it sound really good. So when you hear some of the harmonies, um, I don't know if it's ever happened to you if you're in a choir and you hear somebody singing a harmony, you'll go with the strongest voice. So with the placing of the choir, our musical director, Nora Walsh, who's really talented, when you come in to the Forget Me Nots, nobody asks who has dementia, who doesn't. She says, are you soprano, alto, tenor or bass? <laughs> All she wants to know. Then you sit according to your voice group. And then the volunteers who uh, are from local choirs who learn the harmonies stand behind the group. So if we stand behind the sopranos and belt out the soprano line, then the people who have dementia can tune into the soprano line. So people who've had a diagnosis who've been told maybe they can't learn new, uh, new songs, much to that because not only have we learned new songs but we've learned harmonies and not only have we learned new songs that are not in our repertoire <coughs> new songs but brand new songs that have just been scored so what you're going to hear now is a brand new song Pete St John is an Irish um, he's a songwriter and a composer and I don't know if you ever heard that song The Fields of Acton Rye yeah. if you ever went to a rugby match you would definitely have heard it yeah. you know low lie the fields of Acton Rye okay it started as a gentle love song it became a rugby song don't know how that happened. But Pete St. John became very concerned with the climate and he wrote this song called Waltzing on Borrowed Time. And it's very poignant now because we were busy uh, trying to connect on Zoom during the pandemic. We kept going. We still had 130 members, but we were on Zoom twice a week. Really hard to try and get people who never you say, have you got a tablet? Have you got a device? Have you got a what? Which tablet? What? Which tablet? I have loads of tablets. <laughs> so we had then had to make a video and Patrick and I had a good laugh about this the other day about making a video to try and get people online to connect online. So even the whole thing about connect online, what do you mean? Can you plug something in? I got OK, I need to write a video. So the video went uh, through five or six different iterations. So the first one I did, I thought it was really clear. <clears throat> And I sent it out on WhatsApp to all of the people in the choir. And this guy called Canis Kelly, who was a CEO in his former life, he now has dementia and he's now in his 80s. He said to me, he rang me up and he says, Karen, your video is rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Tell it to me straight. And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, you have to be plainer than that. I said, where are you stuck? He says, all of it, start again. Okay. I said, was there anything in particular? He says, you're uploading, you're downloading, I don't even know what you're talking about. And he says, go to the app store. Where, where do I go? Is it in Dublin? I go, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so I started again. And this time I thought, right, I have no clue about technology devices. I'm going to start at the very beginning. So I created a video, which I can share with you afterwards. I, I share it with, with Jackie. And it is as simple as this. It's showing 
when you visit the app store and I show a picture of it on my phone, it's a triangle with an A on a blue background. You press on it, and when you press on that, that's an upload. And sent it back to Canis and he says, you're close. <laughs> we're not there yet. So there was all, and it went through five different times and he says, you're not on the Canis Kelly test. And eventually he said, it won't pass until I can get online by myself with no children or grandchildren. I need to be able to do this. So when we got to about the fifth iteration of it, and each time he says, I've got it as far as here, but that's, that's tricking me here. So as soon as I did it right and it worked, we now have what we call in Ireland, I'm going to share it with you, you can have, you can have it, the Canis Kelly test. <laughs> so once everyone passed the Canis Kelly test and they realised how to go online, how to record online at home using a recording, we've never met in, in, in real life over two years. This was made virtually. So it's, it's an applause to the people who are able to connect online virtually <coughs> and also to learn a brand new song that they, they'd never heard of before, they had no reference for it, and to learn harmonies. And then, because we were going so well, we threw in kids for good measure and the kids were back at school uh, because the pandemic lifted a bit earlier for them and they wore masks, but the kids joined in and then we added a nice third dimension because we thought it would be cute and we have little tiny tots who are this size, preschoolers, who learned how to waltz for our song. Um, the only sad bit of the whole tale is that Pete St. John, who was very ill, he was in hospital while we were learning all of this and we were telling them all the different uh, parts of the journey. Uh, on the day that we had our final performance, when we got back together again at Trinity College this year in March, it was a Tuesday. He died two days early. Oh. He never got to hear it. But you will. So you're going to hear it now. It's called Waltzing on Borrowed <coughs> Time. And it is the composition of Pete St. John. And it is the Forget Me Nots with the girls from St. Bridget's School and the little tiny tots from Mose Montessori. When all the world was green and free and nature knew no fear. When oceans were our saving grace and our rivers all ran clear. And forests were the earth's best friend and virgin snow supply.
all the types of disorders. Um, she ended up in a psychiatric unit uh, for two months. And the only um, psychologist, uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, and neurologist, they couldn't agree what my mom had. And basically, they decided the only way to get her out of their situation is just to do a series of electroshocks to her oh. brain. Uh -huh. um, so after those things not, not having a proper impact on her, I just went and took her out of hospital against you know, medical advice. <coughs> Uh, but just to keep the story short, uh, my mom is now in a care home uh, since November last year, and she's gone through a whole journey that I might, I'll just take you through why we got to this crazy journey in the first place. So, this is other lovely people I met uh, during these uh, last few years, and I found them on social media because when I was trying to find other people, Spanish speakers who have blue body dementia or they have a, a carer or someone they love that is uh, blue body. It was hard to find because it's not a topic that we know in Spanish uh, countries and Spanish communities. We hear a lot about Alzheimer, we hear a lot about other types of dementia, vascular dementia, but not about Louis body. So I found these other people who are exactly having going through the same as me. So people in Venezuela, uh, Pilar is in, in, in Spain, uh, Carmen is in Barcelona, uh, other Pilar in Mexico. Again, this is just pictures of the things we, we share on this WhatsApp group, but it, it has become like a support network for them. So when they have a quick question, they just go and put a message on. So just to give you an idea, what's the situation, for example, in my country? Um, I don't have enough time to tell you about other countries, so I'm just going to go to talk about my country and just quickly compare with, with another country called Mexico. Mm -hmm. So the main reason we have a big challenge in my country is the three-tier political system. Basically, the whole administration for 17 regions. So if you can imagine, like my mom, she went to three different hospitals in three different regions. So they didn't have the history. They didn't know what was going on. They had no clue. My mom ended up not being diagnosed until we took her into the private sector to get a diagnosis. Another, big, and I won't talk every, every single detail, every single data that I, I have on the presentation because I could take here for hours and we have more important things to do and we're here today. But basically, Alzheimer is the most prominent, the most well-known, and the one that gets more diagnosed. But when you look at the data, basically 80% of the mild cases that don't get even diagnosed, and between 30 and 40% of total cases don't get diagnosed at all. So we have a big, a big, big lack of information and processes and protocols in the country. And this obviously prevents early access to treatments, uh, the control of behavioral uh, disorders and also the right medication. So, if I show you the list of and the amounts my mom had in terms of medication, you get like, wow, this is crazy. But, you know, the uh, but it's not all bad news. So, this is Spain, and I just put it in a few dots. This is the, the cities where the institutions who are leading on Louis Body Dementia are. And you'll see that many big cities, peripheral cities, uh, Great organized uh, institutions, so 102 academic papers specific on Louis Body, so there's some hope uh, on Louis Body. Uh, it's just, they seem to be all very doing their own thing in their own side of, of the country. We also have a specialized brain memory units, and I didn't realize that when I started meeting people and I asked them where you're from, it tends to be, again, people who come from these regions where there's more access to a specific units or a specific institutions who have the knowledge or, or the know about body. Again, bit good news is it's all the private and public, uh, either specialized units, medical units, or uh, regional associations like Alzheimer's associations who they say they look after other types of dementias, but in reality they don't know about Louis body, so they don't deal with it. So summarizing. In Spain, these are quite big opportunities. Uh, the problem is nobody is kind of bringing all together with a with a certain <coughs> strategy and trying to improve what we are suffering and any other people with, with carers or, or I mean having. <coughs> um, recently, last year, this is a, a visual artist called Alejandra Morales. Her mom passed away with Louis Body. And she was she's an award-winning uh, artist. We wanted to have her here uh, today with us and doing a visual uh, for everyone, but COVID logistics budgets, we couldn't make it happen. But again, it was the first time I heard in Spain 
something on the main television about Louis Barry. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have Robin Williams in Spain or someone that is well known that can raise awareness. What is happening as well is traditional hospitals are becoming less and less prominent and the private sector is booming. Uh, so if you want to get diagnosed, like in the case of my mom, you need to have, they say, 50,000 euros at least to get all the testing done so then they know it's Louis Barry. In our case, we were lucky that after years of not getting anywhere with the public sector, I ended up going to a private clinic chance that we could afford. And after putting my mom in, in this machine, and I'm sure you're all aware with uh, similar machines, and her standing up with all the medication because she wouldn't, she wouldn't fall asleep on the test, then uh, I was lucky enough that uh, someone who called Teresa Navarro, a neurologist, as soon as I saw my mom in this clinic, said, sorry to tell you, but you know, this is what your mom has because we have loads of them on our clinic in, in Madrid. Another challenge we have in Spain is the shortages of uh, care homes. <coughs> so again, the, the country, the culture is you look after your family at home, everyone stays at home if you can. Unfortunately, <coughs> that is very difficult, especially like my dad is the only uh, first caregiver that my dad had, I'm on hat. So again, we have added problems to, to this. And just to summarize, this is the kind of key challenges in Spain. It's a silent epidemic, just Alzheimer, Louis body dementia. Nobody knows, uh, nobody, you don't hear about it. We don't have no real time data. Um, we know with the only data we have that there is an exponential growth in Alzheimer's and older dementias. And I have some data on the slides that you can look even on the small footprint there. And the social and healthcare is in crisis, absolutely in crisis. Um, yeah, I don't want to go into too much details, but I think we can help. Everyone can help. I don't have a lot of time to tell you about all the countries, but when I started looking at other countries, this is just an example of uh, Mexico in, in green here. And unfortunately, when you look at the, how many academic papers on Louis Body have been published in the last 10 years, there were only two. And two from two institutions, one in Monterrey, one in Mexico, we see as Mexico City. So again, they're a bit behind already on the uh, research side. And if you look at the Mexico context, uh, obviously low diagnosis, uh, growing uh, dementia types uh, slowly, uh, population is aging, uh, Louis body uh, is being reported very, very small, but basically they don't test for it. They don't think it's important in their country after they did a study in 2007. And basically they need to do more research because uh, they're an aging population like a Spanish one. Um, so what have I done since my mom started having a Louis body, apart from being a father? Um, <laughs> and I started my own blog because uh, I realized that people in my situation, they couldn't read academic papers in English, they couldn't read guides and helpful information out there in English. Uh, so I did a credit blog and slowly I'm publishing articles and news about associations like the ones we have here today, any research that has been done in Spain, or anything else that, I, uh, that we're doing uh, to move in, in Spain. Uh, as well as the website uh, and the, the blog, I've been helping some associations here to have some documents translated into Spanish. Again, not because you live in France or you live in the UK, you need to be English speaker, French speaker. There's a lot of people in New York in other cities that they don't speak English or they don't speak French. So having in your associations information in other languages helps uh, reach much more, many, many more people. And here on the left is just a, an image of uh, just a, uh, a newsletter that I sent out basically, thanks to Norma who is in the room and you, you need later on. Uh, uh, it was so kind that basically after six months of me chasing uh, the biggest care home uh, corporation in the, in the country, I managed to convince them that I was going to give Free webinar to the key personnel in the care home where my mom is. So Norma, uh, very um, generous, she woke up very early in, in Mexico time to be able to, to deliver the presentation and I did the simultaneous translation and immediately the feedback was great from the personnel on the, on the, on the care home saying we have no clue about everything you're telling us today, thank you very much. And so the result is we're trying to talk to this corporation if we can do this at a bigger scale and to reach more care homes. I could talk for hours and you might not notice, but um, uh, I just want to, you know, 
ask you or tell you, you know, how can you help? So I just have a couple of slides where there's a few things that I think are quite needed. Uh, so if you think you can help in any way, please get in touch after the presentation. So I just call them next steps, but basically we need funding in Spain because uh, every organization, every institution is just doing their own, their own thing, not really working together as an association or with any strategy. Uh, there's no trials, uh, so you have to come to the UK if you want to have a trial. Even simple things like a 24 hours hotline. Uh, any country is, has already a hotline and wants to have a Spanish speaker in the hotline to also be able to Spanish speakers uh, that they're calling in, you'll get loads of calls, I can tell you, straight away. So again, the simple ways which you can help the Spanish community. And online training, of course, to, to carers and family. Uh, there's nothing in Spanish. So there's no courses out there. There's no books, there's nothing. Uh, even the book we saw before about Louis Bad in a simple way, there's nothing. So please uh, get involved if you can. And the last but not least, uh, it's, this is more technical. Uh, so basically, the summary is we need to improve the, the diagnosis uh, we need to have protocols. There's no protocols in the 17 regions in Spain about Louis body. So you, you end up like myself in a hospital where people just say, is your, is your patient or is your patient? Uh, well, it's not working, let's put it in the psychiatric unit. And then we need to create a map so we know where people are, uh, what help can be done by the local institutions. And then we have uh, to improve uh, how we collect those data and as well as working together, hopefully, with other organizations around the world that can help create something in Spain, or at least start working with existing associations or outside of associations, etc. We already have in the country. So that's me from for today. And that's uh, Gabriela saying that's enough. <laughs> and that's just my mom. So thank you so much, and thank you from her. sharing that. I appreciate that was, was difficult and we are <laughs> thrilled that you were able to, to share that presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, can you just pick up that slide? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Easy now. Sorry. Um, her cognition started to decline, as many people experience, 
and her GP, her general practitioner, was kind of unconcerned and thought that, you know, okay, this is, I think his phrase, I remember the, the date, was that we won't get a little older. But it was far beyond that. The information that we were, uh, had available was very, very limited. And weirdly enough, my father was so uh, specific about this, he found that there was a Cleveland clinic in Canada, and as most people know, Cleveland is not in Canada. <laughs> but they had this private clinic, and so got her into a, uh, a program there, which basically was two days of full rigorous testing on every aspect of cognition and uh, physical aspects. And basically, most of it was used for people who are CEOs, where if in a public traded company, they want to make sure that if they're hiring somebody at a senior level, that they are going to be able to perform that duty. So they suggested that she had a condition that might lead towards the dementia. Now, in 2008, so that was it, that it may lead towards LBD or Alzheimer's. Um, that's myself, my mom on the right, a few years after that prior picture of my, her sister, who now has Alzheimer's. Um, and in 2016, she, my mother died of uh, complications from silent pneumonia. And that, as uh, some of the doctors were talking about earlier on, to me, that's the number one thing, is that we had no idea. And so silent pneumonia, which I'd never heard of before, was full-on pneumonia that was not presenting with any symptoms. I walked with her. Uh, she was using a walker, as you see in the picture. But anyway, I walked with her two days before she died. For 45 minutes in the park, you know, it's holding on to her the whole time. Still, like so that these things can happen that quickly. So, um, I think a lot of people probably have experienced this as diagnose and adios, right? And we'll see you in six months. Have a nice day. You have this condition, right? And we experience that. Um, I think a lot of people do. Toronto is the fourth largest city in in North America. Weirdly enough, I never think of Mexico as being part of North America, but Mexico City is actually number one. But the resources are still extremely limited. Um, national health care is provided much like the NHS here, but at the same time, it's the demands for dementia care and resources are extremely limited, um, definitely underserved. Uh, and you know, to my mind, the greatest needs are for those people who are living with the condition right now. I love the idea of research. I like to see where this is going. I have the hope for the future, but People are suffering right this minute. And I think the biggest impacts that could be made is in care, information, advocacy, and education. <laughs> and so I'm hoping that that's going to be happening even that much more now. At the time, uh, the resources that we had in, available in Canada were pretty limited. Um, the Whitworth book, uh, Louis by Dementia, that was sort of my Bible initially. <coughs> Tiba Snow's videos on Louis by Dementia were fantastic, but they're hard to find, they're hard to get. The DVDs were expensive, the internet was somewhat limited. There were as few and limited uh, web resources available at the time. The Alzheimer's Society was the only thing that had anything to do with Louis body in Canada. Um, we had local community groups, but you know that's only for urban Canada. I think that's probably the case everywhere. So in Toronto, there was a support group, an in-person support group that I went to with the Alzheimer's Society. But there's a long wait list. They're few, far between. Um, they're hard to get, somebody to get to. Um, and there was wait lists, so I waited probably at least eight months and was very active in my advocacy. Um, the online resources at that time, Yahoo groups were really important at that time. So that I think probably the most important one that I recall was caring spouses, but it was limited to spouses. So that didn't really get the whole, whole piece. Facebook groups were starting to build up in popularity and use at that time. Um, and the beauty of Facebook is the ability to discuss Aware of components and components <coughs> and information, um, and the fact that they're twenty four seven available and that they're international, so that you know if you have a crisis, it doesn't necessarily happen between nine and five Monday through Friday. So the fact that these people were online all the time was amazing. Um, my background was in strategic communication, so I worked at the third largest university in Canada, and uh, our mandate really was around knowledge mobilization was the catchphrase at the time. Basically, that was making the research findings of the whole range. And my, my area dealt with everything from accounting to women and gender studies. So the research would come out and it would quite often be fairly obscure. Um, so what we really tried to do is translate that into something that would be meaningful and understandable to a broader range of people. So um, I joined these Facebook groups and in 
2015, there was a few thousand members at the time in the two biggest ones that I joined, the joined the four, I think. Um, after a period of time, because I was so active and probably never shut up, um, I was invited to co-administer the two largest groups. And now there's over 21,000 people in two groups that are co-administered. And it's, it's profound how much of a difference that makes to the members. One is a combined group of people who are living with the condition and their carers. The other one is primarily geared towards carers. Uh, but, you know, 21,000 people is pretty amazing. Um, you know, the interactions are incredible. And so what I started to do back then was learn about the Louis Tuesday posts. And that would be basically some of those bits of research that would become available. They would not be translated into a form like some of the stuff that we saw this morning. I, you know, I, I've been dealing with this for years and it's still, I can't take it in quickly enough. So, you know, I translate some of this stuff. I plan and schedule posts uh, at specific times of the year, for example, in North America. I don't know if you have that here as daylight savings time. And so we have an hour shift twice a year. You lose an hour in the fall and gain an hour in the spring. Anyway, changing your schedule by an hour is very significant if you have any health issues. The number of heart attacks that happen at that period, both gaining the hour and losing the hour, is is, is very significant. So I told people like, just change your clocks gradually. You don't need to do it all an hour at a time. Um, I'm not doing active uh, creation on Instagram or YouTube. Other people are doing some great stuff. Also created the louisbodydimension.ca website or louis.ca. Um, the goal behind that was to make it simple, printable, and in multiple languages. And as Jose was saying, you know, like there's limited resources in most languages. So this has a translation feature and it's been interesting to see how that's gone because Google Translate has become better and better as time has gone on, but it's not searchable in those other languages. You have to search to find it in this language. Um, the content was based on the most common problems that were uh, uh, that I saw on the Facebook group, so I geared everything specifically towards that. Um, the it's, it's social media and search engine optimized so that there's graphics for each component so that when people are posting, they'll get the content. Um, hopefully there's minimal duplication because there is such amazing content that's available. I don't want to restate something that's already much better said. Um, did podcasting in 2016, um, and that was really geared towards making it so that people who couldn't sit down and re spend the time would be able to get the content um, in a different format. Um, I've not continued that. Um, it's fairly time consuming. Some people have taken up the baton and are doing it, I think, even much better than myself. Um, I started also doing, about four years ago, summarization of research, findings, news, developments, and posted that on uh, Facebook. It's not a group exactly. Um, so it would be a link to the source document as well as some sort of summary so that you didn't necessarily need to go and read the whole piece because a lot of times it was just too complicated. So that has been an ongoing thing. So, you know, things like the, the questions that I think people had today, you know, genetics, that's a really big one because so many people worry, am I going to be getting this, you know, and the, the GPA genetics and so forth are content. I curate the content so it's all applicable, searchable, um, and it really needs to be simplified as much as possible. And upcoming, I'm going to be transferring all the content that I put on Facebook over to my website because the Facebook is not, it, it has its own idea of what it wants to give you. And I'd like the stuff to be available and more easily searchable and to have the content available so that if somebody's looking for something on genetics, they're not going to get one thing about genetics and then another thing about cosmetics, which I've seen in searches from Facebook because it's, it's mandated to advertise, right? So um, I want them to be optimized for this pur purpose. And also, a lot of times, as time goes on, there become dead links so that uh, the information is no longer available, even if it is somewhere. So I'll be making PDFs of the content as well. Limitations for me is I'm not a charity or a foundation or anything. I'm a one-man show. So inevitably, you get uh, limits on resources and availability of things and impact. Um, but the time I haven't spent on those other elements, like the fiduciary components of being a full association, I've dedicated to this. 
Um, I was the inaugural elected co-chair of the Dubai Dementia Association's Living with Louis Advisory Council. And to see how much time went into that without it actually getting where it needed to go was also illustrative. But still, um, things go on. And so I'm pretty optimistic about the future. Today was really lovely in terms of the presentations that happened. You know, the people really have a lot to, uh, there, there's something to look forward to. I think the biggest thing for me is actually the Louis Body International piece. And the, the fact that, you know, like I've met a whole bunch of people here today that I've never met before from multiple locations. Even yesterday, somebody was going to be forming a, a group in Israel, um, as well as people who are presenting here today. And that, that I see as really being a bright future because the information should be available absolutely everywhere. And it's getting better all the time. I think there's better cooperation. Technology is making resources more accessible and easily available. And I think that the unity of both is really going to create the momentum. But um, I want to thank you for your inspiration and everything that you're doing every day. I think you know you, you really have to remind yourself what a difference you make, whether you're living with the condition and making the best of it, whether you're caring for somebody, whether you cared for somebody, whether you're researching it. You know that that makes a, a big difference, and I think you should be proud of it. Thank you for your time. And thank you very much. Um, I was fascinated when you were talking about the podcast because I know my husband has done in the past um, a blog, yep. which has been all over the world, and he didn't even know what he was doing when he first did it. He was writing notes for the consultant. Well, so, but that has grown into a huge thing. So, thank you, and it's it's good to hear what you're doing. Well, there's some there are some really great uh, podcasts. Also, Kareem Weisman uh, is doing a podcast, right? And uh, he's been doing that. He does a lot of interviews. You've got Tea Time with Lou, which I would it's essentially a podcast as well because it, even though it's live, there's other components. Um, there's some really really amazing things going on, and the blog piece, like Jose said, right? That, that's what my website started as. It was purely a blog, and then I thought, well, why, why not just be more broadly available? So these things morph, morph into things that you don't Thank anticipate. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Just as Tim is about to sit down, I'm going to invite him back to take great, part in the panel discussion. So if uh, Karen and Jose, and maybe Gabriel wants to join us. Yeah. <laughs> I think you need to make a change. <laughs> Otherwise, oh, can be that. It's been a long time since we sat in a high chair. I know. It's not <laughs> easy to get on it, are they? I think they're not. Yeah. They're not. Are you familiar, like I know internationally it's hard to get single groups to translate and combine each other, but with networks like the World Young Leaders in Dementia or the Global Brain Health Institute or Brain Lab, are you connected with any of those groups? Uh, I'm not, and the, the main reason, and thank you for bringing that up, basically what I found in Spain or Spanish communities, these single institutions will have to create their own network, so they will access European funds, they will follow mine and other uh, program that it already exists, but not necessarily to like to share that knowledge uh, broadly or collaborate in a strategic way with other organizations or programs. So, yeah, any program you might be aware in Europe or across the world, uh, please let me know so I can follow up mm -hmm. and chase them and tell them that there's a Spanish community that needs help. Exactly, or, or likewise, let them know you exist. Right? Yeah. yeah, thank, thank you. That's that. very kind. Of, and again, like Tim was saying, you know, if you're doing a podcast or whatever, if, if you can do one for the year in Spanish, inviting like a Spanish speaker that you might have in Canada or wherever you are, you're already opening your uh, you know, your reach to any other uh, people might live in your country with a different language. Well, I just, I kind of wanted to add on to that because GDHI has started a Latin America group. So it would be really critical that you get those linkages to occur. I work with the University of California, San Francisco, 
and their ability to, you know, get out into the Spanish speaking neighborhoods and kind of expand that. Everybody right now is really, really trying to make outreach for multiple, you know, reasons, getting people of different heritages and nationalities into research or meeting their needs. Um, because I know in various languages, the word dementia doesn't even exist. It is in, in, in Scandinavian country, it's called a non word. And in Spanish speaking countries, I mean, my sister and my father's carers were like, oh, dementia, you, no, dementia isn't a word, crazy is a word, right? Or lunacy is a word. But so it, it's, it's really imperative that we get into these communities and kind of change the tide and educate and instruct and engage because um, it's going to make a huge difference in their quality of life. That was a very good point uh, that you mentioned that when I first thought about Spain, I thought, okay, well, I need to start creating a charity that's going to help people here locally in Spain. But as soon as I went online, like most multiple social media networks, you realize you can be helping remotely any Spanish speaker anywhere in the world pretty much. So it's great to do something locally, but you could be helping other local organizations or charities anywhere in the world, just by having information in the language. Yeah, there's a lot of work being done. Um, I'm um, an Atlantic fellow as well, the Global Brain Health Institute, but I'm from Trinity College. And um, in Trinity College, we have an Argentinian there at the moment um, who has founded this Brain Lab. And there are a number of people already working in Argentina and all around Brazil. And, you know, I know they're Portuguese, but, you know, they've Spanish as a second language where English isn't as accessible to them. But I can certainly connect you with all of those people. There's so much work being done. But this is the whole point of this conference, I think, is that there's lots of good stuff being done. But they're in little villages and little towns everywhere. And I think what we need is some of the things like where we are right now is to, to unify all of this to start sharing information. And I think this, thank God we're back in, in person again, because I think an awful lot of these conversations happen in panel groups and cups of coffee, because, you know, when you're online for two years, all you're doing is you're getting a presentation and a presentation and then boom, that's gone. You're on the, you don't get this opportunity. So we're very lucky to be here today. And thank you to Jackie and all the organizers who've done this and allowed us and also allowed us the space to have those coffee moments and the lunch times when you can say, I know somebody who's you know going to be able to work with you on that. And I think that is the real power of being someone like this. Certainly I'm connected. <laughs> and the question time, just you know, for for whoever do it the program, I think it was probably Jackie as well. The question time I think sometimes is just as important as the presentations. Mm -hmm. Your voices are the most important in the room. And as far as the uh, you know, if people are looking for other avenues for getting specifically for different either geographic locations and or uh, languages. I think the social media thing, if you just post, because I know monitoring and administering these groups, people regularly will say, I live in Jersey City. Is there anybody there that has this? You know, if you were to post something saying like, okay, anybody who's Spanish speaking or is in Spain or wherever, you probably will get, and it's not going to be millions of people, but those people are often connected to other people. So again, like that's that's a big, you know, as much as social media is probably a nasty thing, it's also fantastically powerful for those purposes. I think social media is a great thing for what you said really meant a lot to me because there are it's like I think about the day, but it to me, it's also you said thank you because sometimes it's they got my HD, they got my leadership career. Yeah. Um and saying thank you like that because you sometimes look behind closed doors. It's great hearing about the language thing, because I'm hoping to go on social media and lecture. But when you were talking as well, I was thinking of Joanna Logan and Dana, the great singers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really miss. But, yeah. but also, um, when I gave up my nursing career, I did get some work working one to one. Because as a nurse, we're too busy medication with this. I got an amazing job with two people, but one man in the advanced Alzheimer's who taught me and taught him. And we used to walk around, and I can't actually sing, unfortunately. But um, I don't know why, but I can't. I used to walk around the care home for ages, singing. And I used to say, oh, you're a great singer. Oh, thank you. But the care staff didn't really like that, but it was absolutely great for him. And for him, he liked to listen to the channel horn to the classics as well. Yeah. So music yeah. is so important. And yeah. luckily, I'd been in, in amateur dramatics and things like yeah. that. So I didn't know. Sometimes I couldn't remember the whole bit. We would sing them all. Yeah. Long way to temper.
really. Yeah. Another just but another time I was in uh, a nursing job, I was training, and I was in a behavioural unit. So I helped people the second day, and I saw the same man there, and he was in a bit of a state. And I thought, but when you're learning, you, you don't have time. I grabbed him at one point and sang a song on the and grabbed his arm, took opportunity. I don't have friends next to whatever. And his wife came in and she said, Oh my God, you're a suicidal young to be doing now, sang a song on the And you know, sometimes I think we do miss a point, and this is a really great opportunity yeah. for me to, to reach out to, to other people. I haven't really thought about that in our communities because we tend to think, we don't think, we're just so tied up in fear and own dramas and yeah. um, things that. I think that's great for me to know that really. Yeah. I mean, it's transformative. Yeah. yeah. And everyone here could talk to the local care home or yeah. community hub and just say, you know, do you have someone with this kind of symptoms? Could we come and give a talk or could we come and help in any way? And you probably will find people that might have any spectrum in the body and be at the end. The, the choir was created by, um, I'm not sure if I, I shared this or not, but my sister uh, set up the choir or, or left, um, for our mother. My mom had Alzheimer's disease. And so my mom had been a very sociable woman. And um, we had parties, a lot of parties in our house when we were small kids. My dad was a really gregarious guy and he just loved a big party. Uh, no televisions, no cars, we had no money, but we, there was always a party in our house. And my dad died very suddenly um, when he was 54. And my mother became a widow with five children at that stage and the party stopped and our house just became a little silent for, for a long time. And then over time, we all grew up, got married, had kids. And then when the first grandchild came along, there was just joy back in the house. There was laughter. There was a bit of crack going on. And then, you know, over time, the laughter came, the fun came again. But we discovered that mom, then when she got dementia, the joy went out again and we thought, oh, not again. Because the last time had been very dark, you know, when the lights were going dim again the second time, Orla, my sister said, right, we've got to do something here. And instead of just waiting till this curve happened, you know, she said, Mam always loved to sing, let's set up a choir. So uh, she did exactly that choir. And when she did that, it started with 15 people on a piano. Mm -hmm. And it grew to this amazing thing that is like a movement. But people who come to the choir, including my mother, you know, she could be like a wasp on a Monday, full of bad temper. She comes to the choir on a Tuesday, sings a few songs, happy out. You come into lunch, yeah, <laughs> and you get this sunny, sunny person back again. And it is the music that has transformed her. And the mood stays on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. By the weekend, she's nearly slipping again until you're back on Tuesday. So, you know, to try and punctuate a week, if, if your, your loved ones are in care homes, even if they can introduce music just once a week, to just monitor and see how the mood levels flow by introducing yeah. something really simple like that. And what you did was instinctive, singing along with Tipperary. You saw that that man needed something in his life, you know, and a simple song or a chat or putting on some music or connecting in some way, that does the trick. It doesn't have to be an elaborate choir, small things work as well. Babies are brilliant. And small kids, when yep. you introduce small kids into a nursing home, and when we were doing that video, you know, the most popular people in that entire video were the little tots learning how to walk, because people love kids. Yeah, sure. You know, we were all ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah, we, we need more people to go and talk to care homes, and just so they think differently, because they think they need to care for people, not necessarily look after them as they would to anybody else that is part of their family. So if you can yeah, talk to your care homes, Help them be a family. Okay, can I raise a point with her? So, um, I have a similar issue with care homes with my father. He, um, he has a body dementia. He's, sorry, he's passed on uh, now, but um, finding a care home placement uh, proved to be so, so difficult because the formulation that they kept creating for his care plan always just highlights the challenging behaviour that he fluctuated. He had far fewer challenging times than good times. However, the formulation would always create those as the major things and the care homes then would either say we can't meet his needs or um, we'll have to put him into some sort of secure place. When we did find a find placement, 
they hadn't a clue about the body and dementia. And we then, my sister and I, started um, talking to care homes about <clears throat> excuse me, the level of training. And I think this is one of the issues. Um, the level of training, even in the, the um, higher end of uh, dementia care homes, is so low. It's MBQ level two, 10 hours online, two hours face to face, and then that's it. They're let loose with your loved one. Um, and also the pay. They are not paying them what they deserve for such an important job. Um, we had a little bit of success with um, Akari Care Homes, where, as a result of our case, because they have police on speed dial, um, the care homes, the ones that we um, had experience with, the, to call the police if somebody became challenging because they didn't have de escalation training or any um, distraction training or anything like that. Um, Akari Care Homes are the only ones that have actually created a specific role uh, for their care homes in the UK to try and roll out that training. However, they're so far behind. I think anybody in a situation like my family with somebody with any body dementia needing a care home place is still going to find it difficult in yep. getting um, their needs met in a care home facility. I'd welcome talking to you after this yeah. uh, conference to see how perhaps we can um, talk about not just Spain but mm -hmm. the UK and getting this training sort of rolled out for de escalation when it comes to challenging behaviour. Pretty much your training, I saw it on the news, but it was uh, pressing a bit into a cup. I was wondering why I wasn't like it because I did my job, I didn't have to the residents as well, you know, because that, that's not my job here. But I People report to the police if they tell yeah. something. So you get to that age, you've got dementia, and you've got a criminal record, yeah. you've got a criminal record, and so that the care home could get more money, but it could never be that we'll go out fast and so I just want to ask because it We've got a few hands up over here, and then we'll yeah. come to yeah, I just well, I there's so much going through my brain because I sit on multiple advisory councils, but I have a connection in the US. A woman has developed in the state of West Virginia. Uh, dementia awareness uh, training for first responders, and she is going to be going global here very, very soon. It is now mandated in the state of West Virginia that every first responder have this training. It is, it is absolutely essential, and that's only happened in the first few years, the uh, last few years. But in, in the United States, it's every municipality has to come up with their own plan. You imagine that, mm -hmm. you know, um, I have, I have a, a community, it's called In Response, and it just started in, um, just, you know, four months ago, where what they're doing for, to, re, to react to drug, drug-induced problems or homeless issues or mental health is calls come in through dis dispatch centers, and the dispatcher kind of assesses what's going on, and then they can say we're calling in response and that will put paramedics along with mental health professionals on the street. So I contacted the chief of police and said, well, wait a minute, what about dementia? What about the response to people like my population who have profound neuropsychiatric symptoms? We're an afterthought. We're much further down the road. But it, again, it's educating the professionals around all of it. We have to become somewhat civically engaged and say, all right, this is an unmet need in our community. And even if it's just, here's a national association or an international association, what can they bring to bear to help educate these people? Because we can't have, especially in the US, people coming into a, what they consider a mental health crisis. And of course, our problems with guns in the U.S. Um, and you, let's say you have a rancher or someone that has guns in his home and you have a flotilla of police coming in armed, that's not going to end well. So it really does behoove us to inform our first respond, responder community as to what our disease particularly is about and how they should be responding. We have to be advocates, every single one of us. Jackie, you can check in for me. I'm going to come and stand at the front. <laughs>
Um, I'd just like to reply just on behalf of the Lewy Body Society on two points. First on Helen's point about responders. Um, for the last couple of years within the UK, there's been something called Dementia Friends. Um, it's not something that I'm a great fan of, but it, it's certainly not training. Um, Kennel, kennel back this up for me. Um, it's not training, it's awareness. But a lot of areas within the UK, um, especially police forces, um, ambulance service, fire brigades, all the staff have undergone the awareness sessions. Yeah, and, and that's been happening for years. That's lovely. Um, but as I say, I would not deem it training. No, yeah? no. Um, secondly, sorry, I don't know your name, Jessica. Jessica, um, to respond about her homes. We take calls on a weekly basis about people who have a relative in her home who are being asked to remove that relative because they have, I should say, in inverted commas, challenging your home. We find people that are unable to place a relative in a care home because they have charged My dad, towards the end of his journey, um, was in Kerbal. And there are pockets of good Kerbals. And there was a gentleman in that Kerbal, and he did get aggressive. But the Kerbal manager went back to the health authority. She got extra funding. And she got a purse, one curer, 24 7 to be with that man. It was no longer a problem. Because previous to that, they could not get the gentleman in the shower, in the bath, anything. No. And it's because he was frustrated. He was bored. He had no stimulation. The whole dynamics changed. He, he stopped hitting out at people, he stopped getting aggressive. And that was just because they had a fantastic co-home manager who went to get that. But that is not everybody's story. And because the co-home manager made it a point to learn about blue body dementia, because this gentleman as well had blue body dementia. Um, but I have raised this on numerous occasions in the UK with the Curve Quality Commission. <laughs> and the response has been, we can't force co hosts to stay. I have raised it with a member of our specialist advisory committee, Professor Alistair Burns from Manchester, who is director for Dementia for NHS England, and about people being unnecessarily sectioned and about people being unnecessarily prescribed antipsychotics. My uncle was. So, you know, they, this has got to stop. But I just want to tell you that we are aware of it. We're taking the calls. Um, as part of our evaluation of the Admiral Nurse Service, of which you'll hear more this afternoon from the two Rachels, um, we have been seeing an increasing number of calls coming through and requests from her homes. Rachel Thompson actually did a session a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think it, I can't remember whether it was in person or online, but we've, we've seen these requests coming through. And as part of our specialist advisory committee, we're looking at what our education package should look like and what groups, even looking at Parkinson's nurses, because it's surprising how many Parkinson's nurses know nothing about dementia mm -hmm. and they are the only nurses that people some people have access to yeah and there is a definite training need identified there so that's sorry to kind of hijack but that's just <laughs> that's just to give you um, a little update on where we are at and that these things are on our agenda you know what? I'll I'll add in my comments um, at the end of my part of my speaking. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, as a person living with Lou body dementia, and I give lots of talks, 
And one of the things that Heather and I are involved with is called Time for Dementia. And it was started by Sussex and Brighton Medical School. And it's mandatory part of their training now that all medical health professionals have to go through this Time for Dementia process. And they come to our homes and lots of other people living with dementia three times a year over two years. So that's six visits. And the last lot we had were, were medical students. And they said, we can learn things from books and from, you know, uh, lectures, but we don't know how dementia affects the families. And they're learning this from their visits. And I heard one uh, doctor who came and spoke to me, and he said he had done this time for dementia uh, program. And he was on the ward one day, and they were in the process of just about to call security to some lady who was getting quite upset and depressed. And he went over, he said, and he got down to her level and spoke to her because he had done this program and calmed the situation down. The last thing that lady needed was security or police yeah, coming in this yeah. up. So they're trying to roll this out through many more universities in the UK <coughs> and it's starting to work. So <coughs> that is one thing that is positive that they're doing and it's working. And we're proud to be a part of it, aren't we? Oh, I would have proud of it. Thank you. Um, uh, really great to be here this afternoon. My name is Angela Lundy and I'm from the United States. I work at Mayo Clinic there and my area of interest in research has been in improving the lived experience and understanding the subjective experience of both people with dementia as well as their care partners. <coughs> and I want to underscore one of the, I think, common themes we're hearing here and in some, in, uh, in a research project that I did a number of years ago that, that still really resonates with me. Um, we, I was on a consulting team and what we were charged with doing was going into, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bit of a cold here, but was going into care homes and helping staff and families with challenging behaviors. And I know why we put that in quotes, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think we all understand that, but we really wanted to get to the root cause um, of why these things were happening. And so we collected data for about 10 years um, on all of these care homes that we visited and consulted in trying to improve um, the situation. And we found that the number one cause of irritability and agitation and aggression, you name it, was boredom. Mm -hmm. And so we think about, you know, we're, we're taking and the, the consequences that people with dementia have to go through because they're bored and they're not, they're wanting we all you know we all have a need it's an emotional need we all have to feel worthy uh, to feel um, that we can continue to contribute and to feel that our lives have purpose and when that's not being met whether we have dementia or don't have dementia guess what we get agitated and irritated and if you imagine the life of somebody with dementia day after day after day, not feeling worthy, I mean, if we were like, we would get agitated uh, and maybe even aggressive. So sometimes I think, you know, we're looking and, and including that in trainings because we think, I think we set, you know, we think that there's some complicated thing that we need to do to improve the lives of people with dementia. Um, and so much of the training in, in care homes is about taking care of physical needs, right? Making sure they get three baths and making sure, you know, all these sort of things get checked. And sometimes we have to do that because we have regulators who ask us to do that. Imagine if we had regulators who came in and one of the standards of good care was how much um, ability we had to get to know our, our, uh, the individuals there so that we could create reasons uh, and, and we could create activities and, and purpose for them. And that's why these choirs work so beautifully mm -hmm. as well. The music is one thing, it's but the activity. sense that they feel they're contributing yeah. and belonging, I think is that magic pill that keeps uh, your mom sustained in her mental well-being uh, day it's after day. It's the social day. engagement as well. What we noticed in the choir um, in the early days when we set it up, uh, people arrived on a Tuesday morning. It was from 11 till half 12. And they'd arrive just on time or maybe a little late and dark colors a lot of dark colors 
And then over time, we noticed people coming earlier and earlier, and then they were looking for jobs. Will I put out the chairs? Will I do this? Will I take the names? You know, and, and the colors were getting lighter and the women were getting hairdos and lipstick <laughs> and heels. And we're going, something's happening here. We are witnessing this is, and the, it got to the stage when performance, you know, people dress like they're going to a wedding. Yeah. And the guys are there in suits and ties, and we're going, you look amazing. And you go, I'm at a performance. You know, but it's that whole thing that, you know, and the nursing home managers have noticed that in the care homes where a lot of people were coming from, um, they used to book their hairdo for Friday because they had visitors coming at the weekend. They all ask, could they have their hairdo on the Monday? Because they're going to the <laughs> Something is happening, and it's not just the singing. It's a phenomenon of singing together, you know. And, and I love what you said about the whole thing about boredom. Wouldn't we be bored stiff if, if the only things we had to do all day was have a shower and take a tablet? And nothing else just to, to keep us going? Yeah. I mean, that's a no-brainer, that answer there. But it's funny that had to be a study. To find it I out. know, to show that, right? I know. But it does, yeah. It's usually the obvious things, isn't it? Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Nothing on the on there, Chris. I didn't have the last word in my no. <laughs> um, I just think that everyone's talking about sense of purpose, and the number of times that I've given talks, and it's all about the sense of purpose. You know, I had my diagnosis and lost my job in three months. I didn't have any sense of purpose, and until I found that sense of purpose and a reason to get up in the morning. And I used to be the most placid person, and now I get a bit aggravated. <laughs> it's, it's aggravation and it's um, frustration at myself and things I'm no longer able to do. And I think if you're living with dementia, it's important to look at the things that you can still do and not at the things that you can no longer do. Because it's easy to do the things you can no longer do. It's hard to do the things that you can still do. And the singing of things is brilliant. And I was talking to a, a colleague and he'd been given a talk at a, a care home. And there was a gentleman there who'd stopped eating and stopped drinking. And he sat next to him and he said, I noticed you're not eating and you're not drinking. He said, why? He said, because I don't have any money to pay for it. No. All they did was give him a wallet with some coins in it. And he started eating because he had money to pay for his food. Oh. We're all used to carrying money in handbags and wallets and things. So give that person some normality back that they should never have lost. Sorry, I'll shut up now. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you to our fantastic uh, Because when I was listening to those presentations that you did, um, I just made a few notes and what struck me was about everybody here today, not just the people who have been presenting, but yourselves in the, in the audience uh, watching and sharing your insights, just the tenaciousness you have and the resourcefulness you have to improve your lives, living with, living with them, blue body, supporting somebody with blue body. And I don't think that gets recognised enough, really. Um, so I really wanted to just kind of applaud you um, for all of your efforts, because a lot of what you do is in your own time. Uh, you volunteer your time. People have day jobs as well. But um, I think if we totted up the time and the value of that, we would be millionaires. Yeah. So uh, thank you to everybody. <laughs> I've managed to claw back a little bit of time, but I just want to remind you that we have um, an additional lunchtime session, I think it's in the big room, uh, which uh, Professor Daniel, I forgot, Mr. Drubak, Drubak um, is very kindly um, spotted into the agenda. So we have about 10 minutes extra, so get, get in the queue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.